What's up, everybody? Welcome to this special edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I know I'm usually coming at you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over the digital airways of YouTube, but special times call for special occasions, and this is one of them. My guest coming up is none other than the one and only Charlemagne the God, and I could not wait to have a conversation with him because there's so many things that are going on in the world. Yes, we know that there's an election coming up in eight months. Yes, we know that, unfortunately, we're stuck with two candidates, one Charlemagne the God labeled uninspiring. The other he labeled a threat to democracy. We know all of that. We'll get into that. We'll talk about why that is. But the real reason I wanted him to come on this show is because we needed to have a real conversation about the black community when we're talking about politics, social issues, and beyond. We're always talking about keeping it real, right? We're always clamoring for real conversation, real talk, real issues being addressed, right? Well, your wish is my command. Charlemagne the God up next. I can't wait. And you know what? I don't think you can either. Back with more in a minute. Okay, everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for Stephen A's Weekly Picks. Now, everyone knows I live and breathe sports and that I have to be right in the middle of all the action. And how do I do that exactly? There's only one way. I use Prize Picks. You see, Prize Picks is the largest fantasy sports platform in all of the land with more than 3 million members. It's a skill based, real money, daily fantasy sports game where you select two or more players and predict if they will have more or less of their in game stats. But here's the best part you can pick and choose from any of the sports and players you love to watch, whether it's like Kevin Durant, Logan Cooley, Cristiano Ronaldo, or even Justin Thomas. And if you go to prizepicks.com right now and use promo code SAS, you'll receive a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. That's right. You heard me. Go to prizepicks.com. Type in my initials SAS and get a first-time deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. Either way it goes. You know it's easy, right? Now let's look at my picks for today, okay? OG Ananobi, more or less than 18 and a half points Rebounds, assist. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, he's going against Portland. I think I'll go with more. They're the Blazers, okay? They damn sure ain't no trailblazers. We'll call them the Blazers. I'm going with more. OG Ananobi, love seeing him back with the New York Knicks. Let's go to the number two on the list, please. Give me Josh Hart more or less than 26 and a half points. Rebounds, assist, or more. Hmm. He's a rough rider. He's going to get his points. He's going to get about 12, 13 points, maybe even 15 points, five rebounds, whatever. I'm going to go with more. Again, it's going against Portland. I look at the New York Knicks, how they can amp up things defensively, how they create additional opportunities for themselves on the offensive side of the ball. That has something to do with points, assist, and rebounds is on both sides, whether it's offensive rebounds or defensive rebounds. So I'm going to go with more for that one. Next up, Dante DiVincenzo. More or less than 24 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. Again, have you seen him shooting the ball? Have you seen the way he's been playing off of Jalen Brunson? We're going to go with more, okay? This is what they do. Tom Thibodeau ain't going to use his bench for so much. These brothers are going to get the minutes. They're going to log the minutes. They're going to log the production. That's just the way that it goes. And last but not least, the one and only Jalen Brunson, more or less than 36 and a half points, rebounds, assists. Well, first of all, that's an easy one. It's definitely going to be more because he's probably going to have 30 in this game, 30 points. We ain't even count rebounds and assists. So we definitely gonna go with more of this. So on all four of them, OG Ananobi, Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, Jalen Brunson, I'm telling you to go with more. Competition matters or lack thereof. Lack thereof. Listen to your boy when I talk to you, New York Knicks. They're gonna be on more and more and more tonight. Mark my word. Oh, I've been waiting to talk to this brother right here for a variety of reasons. Obviously, in the aftermath of the State of the Union addressed by President Biden, along with a host of other things that have been going on inside and outside the world of politics, and especially inside and outside the black community, who better to talk to than my man, co-host, The Breakfast Club, star of The Breakfast Club, 
an author, by the way, a best-selling author, along with a bevy of other things that you've been doing, the one and only Charlemagne the God. What's going David on? David Smith, what's up, brother? It's good to see you, man. How's you, everything going? I'm blessed, black, and highly favored. You make me want to lose some weight, man. Well, you well, make I'm, me want to get I'm, in shape. I mean, I'm, I'm in shape, but I got to slim down. Well, you gotta, gotta, I had to. Listen, don't use me as the example. I was a nasty, disgusting, skinny <laughs> fat at 208 pounds, okay? So losing all of that fat, that's all I did. And don't don't ever find yourself in a position that I was in, because it was bad. So you yeah, got like 150 now? I'm at 170. Wow. 170. Wow. Lost, well, 30, the, lost 38 pounds. I feel great. I feel great. It looks good on you, brother. Uh, what about you? What's been going on with you, my man? How has life been treating you? Life has been great. I mean, I, I have no complaints, man. Mm. Kids are great. Wife is great. Mm. You know, professionally, everything is fantastic. You know, uh, mentally and emotionally, I'm where I need to be. So that's all you can ask for. Before I get into a bunch of serious topics, you know what's on my mind, right? I was doing my research, just reading up on you, even though I've known you for years, got a lot of respect and love for you. But uh, your dad, is yeah. it true that your dad had a tattoo? <laughs> all right, as a Cowboys fan, and he he was celebrating how they, you know, six time champions. That's what the tattoo said, but they only got five championships. Is that true? Yeah, that is a fact. He got it right after um he got it right after we won the Cowboys won their fifth championship. Right. right. And he got the tattoo that says six time Super Bowl <laughs> champion on his arm. Right. And it's been sitting there since 1996. <laughs> now why hasn't he gotten rid of it? I mean, what's he holding on for? They trying they trying to win again? He's trying to yes. make sure they do it again. Because it's been 29 yes. years. It's been 29 he, 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 years. He want to get number six. My daddy is a diehard Cowboy fan. Like, his nickname is Cowboy. Mm. Like, he talks about you like he knows you. Like, he, right. oh my God. Like, you make him angry yes, I when do. he watches yes, I do. television. Because he knows I'm laughing oh, at him. Oh my God. I'm laughing at him. Yes. Well, why don't you get mad at me? Because you a Cowboy fan. We ain't letting you off the hook. You love the Cowboys. How come you don't get mad at me about it? I mean, listen, I don't get mad. I don't get mad if somebody says something that's true. Right. Right? And, and then, or somebody gives an opinion that becomes true. Right. What am I do? Exactly. <laughs> he was right. Exactly. And, and I've been right for 29 years and counting. I mean, let's not forget that. 29 years yes. and, and, and but counting. What? But guess what? What? Next year, we're going to win the Super Bowl. Next year, we're going to win the Super Bowl, baby. Okay? You're going to really say that with a straight <laughs> I've face. I've been saying it for 29 years. Why would I stop now? So you're going to keep it going. One year, I'm going to be right. How, has things been, how have things been for you when you think about you hosting the, co-hosting the Breakfast Club with my man DJ Envy, who I've known for mm -hmm. years, obviously, and Jess Hilarious, she's been absolutely phenomenal. Major props to her. What has it been like for you in recent, in recent history hosting the Breakfast Club, considering the level of cachet that y'all have built for yourselves and how politicians, aspiring politicians and others come through y'all, through y'all show to make sure they're validated to some degree? What has that been like for you? For me, I don't treat it any different than I treat talking to anybody, man, because, you know, I feel like, you know, I've always said the Breakfast Club is the people show, right? So, you know, the, the people who listen every day, the 8 million monthly listeners that we have who right. tune in, who call in every day, I always feel like I'm speaking on behalf of them. And so for me, I just always keep that in the back of my mind. And I don't change my level of uh, curiosity, regardless of how big the show has gotten. I've never felt like I'm an expert at anything. anything. I'm just a person who has some experiences and I keep a level of uh, curiosity in regards to sitting down and having conversations with guests. So that's how I approach it, even with, with, with political interviews. But is it just about curiosity or is it about this insatiable need to hold folks accountable, particularly when we're talking about the world of politics? Mm -hmm. Because these are people that, you know, put forth legislation and have dominion to some degree over the quality of life that a lot of us experience. What has that been like for you in terms of talking to them? Is it about accountability or is it just about being curious? I, I, it's always about accountability for me, regardless of who I'm speaking to. Like, I, I feel like I held rappers accountable or athletes, like whatever somebody got going on in that moment, if there's something that they need to be held accountable about, I'll do it, just like people hold me accountable about things. So it's the same thing with, with politicians. Like, I, I actually, the exact same formula I have in regards to having conversations with politicians is the exact same formula I have in regards to having conversations with other people. Because I used to be young, you know, watching TV or listening to the radio and asking myself, like, why aren't they asking the most obvious question? Right. Like, like we, we, we see this person sitting there with a horn sticking out their head, but nobody's going to say anything about the horn. Right. So it's, it's the same thing when I'm talking to politicians. Sometimes it's the most obvious questions that people are asking, and, and, it's, and it's all about the follow-up with, with, with politicians, right? Because when you ask a politician a question, their first answer is the prepared messaging that they have from their Absolutely. handlers, right? So the very next question should either be a double down on what you just asked or a simple why. I remember, you know, Larry King, God bless the dead, Larry King told me a long time ago, he said the most important question you can ask in an interview 
is why. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in regards to politicians, that is such a very important question because they'll spit all of this jargon at you, all of this verbal right. jargon, all of these prepared messaging, and then as soon as you say why, that's when you start to see them stumble and fumble because they're like, uh oh. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't know there was going to be a why. I just thought I could just lay the. I got, thought I could filibuster you and it would be mm -hmm. on to the next question. I sit up there and I look at it doing television as long as I've been doing it and being a journalist for as long as I've been a journalist. You find yourself as a black man, I know I do, where you feel the pressure from the community. And I don't necessarily embrace it from this perspective. I don't feel any obligation to feel what other people think I should feel. Absolutely. But I do feel an obligation to make sure that I articulate what a community is feeling, whether it's black, Hispanic, or beyond. Whatever your community is feeling, make sure you ask questions pertinent to that audience. I think I owe them that. What about you? Same, same exact thing. Like, you know, um, I, I, I can, I'm, black people aren't monolithic. Mm -hmm. So I could never speak for a whole community of people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have no problem you know, uh, uh, crowdsourcing questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you want me to ask said individual? Because I can ask a question that I may not necessarily have any feeling about, but I mm -hmm. will ask because I know there's a large majority of people who, 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 want that, who want that question answered. So, yeah, I feel the need to ask questions mm -hmm. for the people, but, you know, you, you can never speak for a group of people because everybody in that group of people wants different things. Mm -hmm. But I think for, you know, the most part, just humans in America, regardless right. of race, anytime we're having these conversations with politicians, mm -hmm. we want open mobility, right? And we want safety. That's it. People want some money in their pocket and they want to feel secure every day that they wake up in, in, in this country. So I think a lot of times, you know, we complicate these conversations about what it is black people want or what it is this group of people want. Everybody in America wants the same thing. But when you say we complicate it, who's the we? Um... I think I think sometimes just people when they talk about these issues because I think sometimes we a lot of people come from a place of privilege, mm -hmm. so it's like we can sit up here and have certain conversations about you know things that are going on in politics and we can talk about geopolitical issues or we can talk about the, the border issues. A lot of those those conversations come from a place of privilege. If you're living in you know uh, Monk's Corner, South Carolina, or uh, the rural area down south like where I'm from, or you living in the inner city like Newark, New Jersey, or Chicago. If you can't keep no food on the table on, or a roof over your head, you don't care about what's going on in other countries. All you care about is why they keep sending money all right. to those other countries. And we basically, we don't have our basic necessities met here. You know, that's one of the things I brought up because, hey, listen, I'm far from a political aficionado, make no mistake about it. But, you know, you read the newspaper, you watch television, you try to stay up on current events to the best of your ability, even though I'm inundated by the world of sports and what have you. But I'm looking at stuff, the kind of stuff that's going on. We've got an election that's coming up. We've got an 81 year that's going to be 82 in November. We've got a guy that's going to be 70, 70 years of age, and he's got 91, he's got four counts against, uh, four indictments against them, 91 counts, and these are the two choices that we have for president. And I couldn't wait to talk to you about this subject because anytime any of us open our mouth, if folks disagree with us, we don't know what the hell we're talking about. It's not that they disagree with us. You don't know what the hell you talk about because you don't agree with them. And even though people are going to say that when it comes to political issues, it seems to be something that resonates far, far much deeper when it comes to us. Mm -hmm. Do you get that impression at all? Absolutely. But and why is that? Um, I think because a lot of those political pundits, you know, a lot of those political talking heads, those academics, they don't feel like we're qualified to have these conversations, even though both of us pay millions of dollars in taxes. How about that? <laughs> you know what I'm that? saying? Yeah. And both of us come from those, uh, those, those, those hoods that a lot of them are far removed from. You know, I don't, I don't speak for what's going on on Capitol Hill. I speak for what's going on in the hood. You know, and, and, and I think a lot of times when you've been on the Hill too long, you know, you don't even realize what is going on with regular, everyday working class people, which is why I love doing radio, because I get to talk to those everyday working class people every morning and see what's, see what's on their mind. What's it been like for you over the last several weeks? I saw you doing, you know, I, I texted you immediately after watching you, you on this week and you were being interviewed about your position about President Biden and where you, you basically talked about both candidates. Mm -hmm. One is uninspiring and yep. the other is obviously a threat to democracy. There's at least people, that's what, that's what they were talking about, you know, attaching to you or what have you. What was it like for you being on that platform, seeing yourself on a Sunday morning? It's one thing to be on the radio on weekday mornings. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You've been interviewed a thousand times over the year at your own show. You got your own show on Comedy Central. You've written books. You've done all of this stuff. But what was it like seeing yourself talking on a Sunday morning 
on a political show. What was that like for you? That's that's a different audience. That's the audience that you know. That's when my mama get phone calls. Okay. You know, that's when they, <laughs> that's when they call my mama and be like, "Oh, I saw you. You know, I saw your son on you know on ABC." That's that's a different uh, level of conversation. But I mean, honestly, it's the same. It, it it's, it's a bigger platform that enabled people to misconstrue the things that I say even more, because you know what I like to say all of the time is that you know the right uh, right wing media does a fantastic job of pushing the narrative they want to push. Left wing media does a terrible job of pushing the narrative they want to push because what you just said is absolutely what I said. Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, but Joe Biden is an uninspiring candidate with no main character energy. Uh, Fox will take that right wing, uh, he's an uninspiring candidate, you know, with no main character energy, and they'll amplify that. Right. And they'll talk about that all day, all day, all right. day. And then the CNN and the MSNBC of the world and the, and the left wing media, they'll talk about what Fox News is talking about. Instead of, why don't you take what I said about Trump being a threat to democracy right. <laughs> and amplifying that right. for, for, for your audience? So, you know, like I said, it just a, a platform like that is just it just gives people uh, it's just a bigger opportunity for people to misconstrue. What this I conversation said. I'm having <laughs> with you right now, Charlemagne, really is about us. It's about the black community because I des I definitely wanted some help in terms of talking to somebody else, not just talking to myself, not just talking to my audience, but talking to somebody who talks to an audience every single day, millions of people every single day. When you look at us right now, the black community and what we have to deal with in terms of our choices, the threat to democracy or the uninspiring mm -hmm. candidate, how should we feel about this upcoming election? And I'm not talking about it just in terms of the candidates. I'm talking about what you and I both fear, which is going to be a willingness for people to go to the polls in droves the way that they once were willing to do, obviously, when Barack Obama was president. Well, uh, you know, this year is all about the Republicans who are the crooks, the Democrats who are the cowards because they don't fight enough in the couch. The couch is voter apathy. And, you know, in November, it feels like the couch is going going to win. And, you know, when it comes to the black people, like I said, I can't speak for all black people because we're not monolithic. None of, None of us can. But this isn't just about Joe Biden and Donald Trump. This is years and years and years of neglect from government. You know, I, I feel like black people fall into a category that my man Tim Ryan always brings up. Well, he, he, he coined the phrase the exhausted majority. I think there's just a bunch of people in America and a lot of black people fall into that category. You're just tired. You're just tired of, of, of politics. It's not the rematch we want. You know, we've been promised change that we can believe in since, you know, President Obama uh, ran for president. And people haven't seen that change. You know, the hood has not changed in, in any way, shape, or form. And, and, and you can't scare people into to voting, even though this is probably the first time in my lifetime that they have, you know, used the same rhetoric that they've been using. Oh, this person is a threat to democracy. And it's, but this time it's absolutely right. true. But We've seen what, it. But that's what pisses me off. Mm -hmm. Because they've been blowing into the wind for so long absolutely. that when you finally articulate a position that appears to be very accurate, right. it falls on deaf ears because it's the same stuff we've been hearing that's for decades. Right. Right. And I think that that plays a role into why somebody like a Trump can be in this position right now. And I'm wondering, listen, I'm not voting for him. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that much right now. I'm not voting for him. But... It's not because of his politics. It's because of his behavior, the kind of person I think he is, and the kind of and, and I believe that he could potentially cause civil war in this country. There are people who feel that I'm ridiculous when I say that. What do you feel about that? No, I, I 100% agree. I mean, we're, we're looking at a Republican Party who's been like overtaken by fascism, and and it's it's not even close. Like this guy already tried to lead an attempted coup of this country on January 6, 2021. This isn't hyperbole when we say these things. He's, he's, he's done these he's things done. already. Like, this is a man who said we should, over, we should overturn the Constitution. I mean, we should get rid of the Constitution to overthrow the results of an election. This is a man whose lawyers were in court saying, well, he never, you know, uh, he never promised to support the Constitution. I don't care if you, what color you are, what your sexuality is, what your gender is. If you call yourself an American, you cannot want somebody to lead this country who doesn't believe in the Constitution. So what does it say to you that there are people in this country who do apparently want that particular individual knowing those specific positions back in that seat, back yeah. in that White House uh, come 2024? What does it say to you about the state of our country that you have people who have no problem with seeing him right back where he once was? Well, they, they, they've accepted fascism. Um, and, and those are the people who I feel like they want, they want their rights to be racist back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, like they want their, they want white supremacy to reign supreme 
over over this nation. Like that's what if people can say whatever they want. That's what this country was founded on. Like when those founding fathers sat fa fathers sat down at the table and they were talking about you know liberty and freedom and justice for all. They wasn't talking about people that look like us. In fact, it actually said we were three fifths of a human. So they definitely weren't looking uh, at at people who who look looked like us or thought of thinking about people who looked like us when they created that. So to me, those are just people who want white supremacy. You know to be at the top. Well, playing the role of devil's advocate, you have folks White on devil's the, advocate. That's right, there you go. You hear <laughs> no, problem, no problem. You do hear folks on the right mm -hmm. saying, wait a minute, we're sick and tired of that R word being attached to us. The Democrats were once Dixiecrats. You had a situation where civil rights legislation in 64, voting rights legislation in 65, Lyndon B. Johnson sitting up there and talking about we'll have the Negro vote locked up for the next 50 years, we do this, but Republicans mm -hmm. assisting, bipartisan-wise, in terms of Republicans and Democrats, both assisting in bringing that kind of legislation to the desk of the presidency. And they say to themselves, they forget what role we played. It was the Democrats that were more racist than you could ever say about us. That's what they say. What does Charlemagne the God say when people have thrown that argument in your face? Because I know, for beyond, I've seen Larry Elder on your show, mm -hmm. along with various others. I've seen Vivek Ramaswamy on your show, along with others. And I know people allude to that. What's your argument when people throw that back at you? Uh, I think it's kind of a ridiculous talking point because even though it's true, we're acting like the ideology of a whole party didn't change. The ideology of a party changed because the base of a party change. Yes, when, you know, the Civil Rights Act was implemented, you know, and, and like that made a, a lot of black people vote Democrat. They voted for John F. Kennedy. Then, you know, they supported Lyndon B. Johnson. So, yeah, the, we're acting like a whole party's mindset didn't completely shift. It mm -hmm. did, which is why I was even saying, you know, the Republicans are the party of the Confeder Confederacy, so I don't know how far you can take them away from that. But I always felt like this year was their year to put somebody else in position other than a Donald Trump. And people are longing for something so different. Like I was saying, they should have got behind Nikki Haley mm -hmm. because people were longing for something for so so different. Mm -hmm. right. I felt like she might could have picked up, you know, votes from both sides of the aisle. Well, you here's know? why I disagree with you. With okay, I disagree with you that with that because. We all know what politicians are about. They're mm -hmm. about maintaining power and Absolutely. remaining in office. And if you have a candidate that seems to have the constituency by the you-know-what, no one's going anywhere, no matter what you do to him, no matter what you say to him. I mean, more campaign dollars was being raised as the indictments flowed in. This is how bad it was. Yeah. And, and, and so... If you see that Nikki Haley has no shot, that Ramaswamy has no shot, that Chris Christie had no shot, that DeSantis didn't have a shot at all or what have you, and you know that's the way the momentum is flowing and you're trying to survive and this candidate is the kind of dude that'll call you out and will turn your own peeps against you. Nobody does that better than Donald Trump. So if you know that, you might be making decisions based strictly out of fear for survival. I, I agree with that, but I don't know if Donald Trump can win in a general election. But I also don't know if Joe Biden can win in the general there election. But I think that, you know, uh, somebody like a somebody like a Nikki Haley or anybody fresh, I think, would have a much, much better shot uh, in a general election than, than, than a Donald Trump was. I think Donald Trump and Biden is a toss up. And it's literally about which one of them can energize those people to get off the couch or which one of them can go out there and capture those people who in the Republican primaries was right. voting for Nikki Haley. You know, and I think whoever can do that is we're going to see who's going to win in November. And the other thing people aren't factoring in come November is voter suppression. There's going to be voter suppression that happens, right? And, and the only defense Democrats ever have against voter suppression is we got to have the largest voter turnout in the history of America. I don't think they get that in 2024. Mm -hmm. So if it's close, you know what Republicans do? They're going to steal it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, just, that's just a fact. So I, I don't know. I just felt like, you know, Nikki Haley or, or anybody else you know, probably gave them a better better shot than um than Trump would. I think mm -hmm. with Trump is 50-50, with, 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 with Biden is 50-50. I'm not sure how, I'm really not sure how Trump fares in the general mm -hmm. election. When you look at it, the audience that's out there right now, and you think about what you just said, as we look at the Democratic Party, first things first, you're Republican, Democrat, and Independent. What are you? I'm registered as a Democrat. You're registered. I, I consider myself an Independent because I don't know why 
Honestly, as a black person in America, I don't know why we're beholden to any of these parties. Yeah, I'm like, not. Like, when I see these crazy black MAGA conservative lunatics, I don't know why they like that. Mm -hmm. And when I see these black liberal ready to cut your head off over mm -hmm. Joe Biden, I don't know why they like that either. As a black person in this country, you shouldn't be beholden to any party whatsoever. I don't think so either, because I don't think either party has done enough for us I as a totally community. Agree. That's totally where I'm at with it. But having said all of that, one of the things that I've received a lot of criticism for is that I've called out the Democratic Party more so than ever before, because I think it's an absolute embarrassment and a disgrace that in the year 2024, you, the Liberal Party, and I know some Democrats don't call themselves progressives, but when we hear progressive, we associate that with the Democratic Party. That's just a fact. So when you look at it from that perspective, I'm sitting there saying, how in God's name in the year 2024 do we find ourselves as a Democratic Party begging an 81-year-old who turns 82 <laughs> for in November to run for re-election for four more years? To, to me, of all the inexcusable things I've seen Democrats do over the last several decades, this might be the worst because you couldn't find anybody? Mm -hmm. That's what I say. What do you say? I agree with you 100%, and I think that when people give us uh, flack for pointing that out or, uh, you know, criticizing President Biden, I would have to tell them to shut the F up forever. And the reason I have to say that is because if you're telling me that there is a threat to democracy on the other side of the ticket. Like somebody that is, you've, you're, you're seeing them strip back all of these different rights. They right. implemented Supreme Court judges that stripping away all of these different rights from us. We saw him lead an insurrect, uh, lead an attempted coup in this country. We saw all of that. If, we, if we're not 100% sure that the person on the other side can win, or we don't feel like they're doing enough to win, or we don't see the sense of urgency coming from them, why shouldn't we press them on that? Like you could look at it from at, at sports, right? If you if you I, I can love my Dallas Cowboys, right. but if Dak Prescott ain't producing, and there might be somebody else that can go out, go out there and win us some games, right. I want that person. I'm in. not sure that's the strongest argument that you can make on this particular day because you started off the show talking about how we gonna win the Super Bowl next year. So I mean, I'm not. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, Charlotte. Man, I, I I mean, I don't know if this is the that's, this is not the time. To, this is not the subject well, to buffer your we'll point. Take, we'll take Dak out of this. I'm just saying if you got a stronger player, right? Are, 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 if there's a potential stronger player that can that can win, put them on. Did you see a stronger player in the Democratic Party? I didn't this time last year. When 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 people were asking me, like it felt like the Democrats had a very weak bench this time last year. Um, but when I heard Joe Biden, President Biden himself say. Very weak the, bench, because it, it sounded, I don't want anybody to I know, every time just, I say that, they say <laughs> that. They, they, say, they say you say bench. No, bench, you said bench. bench B -E -N -C -H. Weak bench. B-E-N-C-H. Well, go yes. ahead. Right. When I saw President Biden say he thinks that there's about 50 other Democrats who can beat Trump, I was like, well, who are they? Who are they? But then, you know, uh, I think Governor Shapiro in Pennsylvania, I think... Um, no, I don't think so. You don't think so? Nope. I nope. think uh, he wouldn't stand a chance. Nope. I, I, I didn't believe in Governor Newsom at first, but I, I started to see him make some maneuvers that I was like, okay, I, I, I can see that. Mm -hmm. um, I like him mm -hmm. in terms of how he looks how polished he is. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like somebody that used to look at Mitt Romney when he was running against a yeah, Barack Obama. Yeah, they were like, yeah. the, he really looks good in those blue suits. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. looks presidential. I looked at Gavin Newsom, particularly when he debated Ron DeSantis on Fox News. I said, okay, he looks the part, but at the end of the day, if you look in California, you see the homelessness, you see the immigration yeah, issues, you right. see the economy, yeah. you see taxes, you see the yeah. price of gas and everything else. I think that's where Trump smokes them. That's my opinion. Yeah, because he, he can always point to California. That's right. I think what's more in the future, in the future, yes. You know, if, if we He's have a, a democracy chance. in the He's future. He's got a chance. He's got a chance. I think Westmore, Maryland. But uh, those, those are like those are like my three right now. I still, I like Tim Ryan, too. Tim Ryan was, uh, I think he was a congressman for yep. in Ohio at okay. one point. I like I like him a lot, too. But, you know, the light doesn't never, never really get shined on mm -hmm. him like that. But those, those three, I think, have some potential. Potential, and I still believe in the vice vice president. I was going right there. That mm -hmm. was my next question. I didn't hear you mention Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris. You still believe in her? I do, but we're in the bottom of the knife. Yes, we're in the bottom of the knife, and you know she's been in that office for over three years now. And I just wish people could see the the, the Kamala Harris that you get when you just having a conversation with her. That is exactly why I don't believe in her. <sighs> exactly that Man. because. I'm not questioning her credentials. Mm -hmm. I'm not questioning her ability to deliver and resonate in terms of a message. My problem is you waited too long not to. Yeah. 
and so much time has passed by. And she's been taking a lot of hits. You know, you VP, you can't you can't do but so much. You got to flow along with what the administration asked you to do. So I blame them more than I blame her. But in the same breath, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, how could you let it get to this point? But they, you know what's so interesting? They gave her. There was a way for her to come in and 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 really have like a, a I don't want to say a heel turn, but like mm -hmm. a, a a turn in her, the character that we saw. Because you had Nikki Haley running around saying we should be, uh, we should have chills up our spine right. for a Kamala Harris That's right. presidency. Like mm -hmm. you know, you had other re people in the Republican Party saying we should be scared to death mm -hmm. of a Kamala Harris presidency. Well, damn, why scared to death? You know That's what? not even language we use for Donald Trump. Are you ready for this? You know where I think she missed it? Where? Ron DeSantis and the state of Florida, the education system, they tried to explain that there were benefits to slavery. And they were challenging folks to debate them on this. And one of the challenges was to the vice president. Yeah. And she passed. And if, you right. can, if you can't debate, and listen, listen, we 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 gonna be neutral here. You know, we're black men, we're proud black men, but we gonna we gonna be neutral here from the standpoint. We're gonna say it as plainly as I can without trying to be offensive. If you can't debate a middle-aged white man who is saying that there are benefits to slavery, as the vice president of the United States, as a former district attorney of San Francisco, the first black woman, yeah. as the former first black state attorney general in the state of California, if you can't debate that subject with a presidential candidate at the time, to me, it was one of those things, yeah, it might be beneath you, you might be swinging down because you're there and he's not because he was aiming to go for the White House. But in the same breath, that issue should have been so piercing to you, that position that they took, that should have been a fight you were willing to embrace. Absolutely, and, and you saw when, that's what Gavin Newsom took up the fight, right? So yes. he, him and Ron DeSantis actually were debating on Fox. I agree with you, like, you gotta go into that lion's den. Like, you know, I know for a fact that a lot of Democrats, you know, in, in her position, they feel like their words get misconstrued by Fox News, so they're kind of afraid to speak right. truth to power the way they want to because they feel like Fox will take a sound bite and run it over and over so for what? their audience. It's, it's, it can be so what if you're willing to go to Fox because they right. can't misconstrue you That's right. when you right there in you're their everywhere. face talking you're, to them. You're everywhere. They ain't the only network That's right. covering you. That's right. President Obama used to go on O'Reilly Factor. Right. Like John Stewart, even though he wasn't an elected official, he right. used to go on O'Reilly Factor. Yeah. You see yeah. Gavin Newsom, he goes on Fox now and, and, and goes, on, goes with Hannity, debates Ron DeSantis. I feel like the VP should have been doing that, especially when they were saying things like, we should be scared to death of a Kamala Harris presidency. You're only saying that because she's black. Mm. You're only saying that because she's black and she's a woman. Mm. Like, there, there's no other thing to fear because if she got into the White House and she became president, her policies wouldn't be any different than any other Democrat. Right. So what is there to fear right. other than that she's a black woman? She should have took that opening and ran with it. What about the notion that as a, a state attorney general, as a prosecutor in the state of California, there were a whole bunch of black folks that she put in jail? What about people who make that argument against her? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm genuinely asking. Yeah, yeah, I don't fully know the answer to it at all, but I do know that, you know, when you talk about, you know, at the time, uh, the, the way that the drug laws were set up in that state, she probably was just following the, the, the letter of the law, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of ways. But, I mean, as, as the laws have changed in this country, I've definitely seen her positions on, on, on marijuana and things of that nature, you know, pivot. I mean, right now, they're, I think it would be... It would, it would serve them so well for President Biden, who can actually do this with a stroke of a pen. He can literally free everybody who's in federal prison for a nonviolent marijuana offense. There's some people who feel like it should be, he should free everybody who's in federal prison for a nonviolent drug offense all across the board. I would like to see them do things like that. I would like to see her leading the charge on something like that and then President Biden signing it. Can you imagine if we heard that announcement tomorrow? Everybody who's in federal prison for a nonviolent drug offense Joe Biden's giving them a party. Especially when we know the crime bill assisted and so many of them being in there. In the begin, to begin on. with, in the 90s, but again, but again, 
Biden was a senator at that time pushing that. Congressional Black Caucus was telling him right. to push that. We have to take into account Bill Clinton. He was in office. Uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, a uh, uh, presidential candidate in 2016. Obviously, she was the first lady around that time. But all of them are connected to that. And Biden took credit for that. Biden, and Biden said, took a Biden lot of credit this for is it. the Biden crime bill. That's what he used to say. Right. 80s, 86 mandatory minimum citizen, 88 crack laws, 94 crime bill. President Biden was like, that was me. Mm -hmm. I did that. So, yeah, somebody like that who has systemically caused a lot of black and brown people to go to go to prison. That's the type of stuff you literally owe black people. Like, and, and you can do that with a stroke of a pen. You don't need Congress to vote for that. You can say, hey, I'm pardoning everybody on a federal level who's in prison right now for a nonviolent drug. But he hasn't. And because he hasn't, what about folks on the right who would say, see, that's them. That's not us. Why y'all constantly looking at us? Why not look at them and what they're not doing? Because they're giving you lip service. At least we're straight up about where we stand and who we are. That's what kind of positions they would take in terms of their policies and their politics, per se. What do you say to that? I would say that, you know, that's never going to garner anybody black to want to vote for people. I think that there's a, a, there's a, there's a misconception that when you see you know, President Biden losing some black voters. And, and there's, a, there's this overstated number they keep saying for Republicans, like 23 percent of if the election was held today, 23 percent of all African-Americans would vote Republican. I don't ever see that happening. But I think just because you see people lo leaving the Democratic Party doesn't mean they're going to the, be Republicans. Right. That couch is real, y'all. Yes. <laughs> some but, of these people are just going to stay home. But in then November. that begs the question, who does the couch work for? For. We know who mm -hmm. we can work against, but who does it work for? If you're the Republicans, let's just say for the sake of argument, I'm looking at some numbers here I'll throw under by you, right? Percentage of votes by party for election year. 2016, 90% of the Democratic voters were black. 1% were Republican. 2018, 16% of Democratic voters were black. Dipped 3%. Still, only 1% of Republican voters were black. 2020, the presidential election, 19% of the Democratic voters were black. Tie in 216. 2% of the Republican voters were black. And then in 2022, which they thought was going to be, you know, a red wave and didn't turn out to be that way, 70% of all Democratic voters were black. 1% of all Republican voters were black. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm looking at is I'm looking at these numbers right here. And I'm saying to myself, if you're Trump and you've got some black MAGA Republicans who are willing to support you, bro, I'm looking at numbers right here and we're talking about Okay, it's not 2%. It's not 10%, but what if it was 4%? What if it was 5%? That could swing the election. I don't I don't know because they're losing they're losing a lot of white women too, okay. you know, and, and Roe v. Wade. Yeah, okay. and, and a lot of white women are the re white women really are the reason Donald Trump got into the White House the first time, but nobody ever brings that up. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. They always want to point the finger at black people and black men and black women. No. White, well, really black men, but really white women were the reason that Donald Trump got into the White House in 2016. I, and, I, and a lot of white women, I guess because of Roe v. Wade, they are moving away from the, the Republican Party. So I don't know how much of a difference 4%, 5% mm -hmm. sways an election. So you're saying you don't think the black vote's going to sway the election. You think the female vote, the women vote, is going to sway the election. I can see, yeah, I can see that more so than, you know, the the, the, the black vote because, you know... That's what I'm looking for in November. Like, Roe v. Wade is a big issue. I can't believe that it's not more people out there in the streets every day tearing shit up because mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade got taken away. And I think that, you know, women are very strategic, mm -hmm. right? So I think, you know, come November, it's going to be a lot of women that remember that because Trump is out there saying, I'm the reason right. Roe v. Wade is gone. He kind of moved away from right. that, that rhetoric, but those sound bites are still out there. Yeah. And I, think, I don't think he cares, though. I think he thinks it's going to work for him. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see that working for him. I, I can, because, I, you know, you, women, you, you, you got, that's black women, white women, see, Asian women, Jewish women. You got all of these different a, women that might mobilize. It's a double-edged sword. On one hand, here's what I believe. I think it's a situation where, okay, you have an abundance of women out there who are pro-choice. How dare you, as a man, as anybody, tell us what we have the right to do with our that's body, Right. right? The flip side is you have an abundance of Republicans that can say there's a whole bunch of women out here who were pro-life and they were the ones that compelled us to do this as well. So I don't know whether that balances itself out. It remains to be seen. I think that's what we find out in this election, according to what you're talking about.
Yeah, I, I, I agree. And if you, but even if you look at like like the midterms, I feel like that was an issue for them. That red wave that you yep. spoke about was supposed to happen. That didn't. I think Roe v. Wade was a big reason why right. it did not it did not happen. So I think in November, yeah, I think you might see a lot more women come out than 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 you think. But the reason I I I, I push back on what people say about the black vote is because. Don't blame this on us. us. You know what I mean? <laughs> like when you look at the approval ratings right, for right, President Biden, right. his approval ratings are down with everybody. Everyone. You yeah. know what I'm Four saying? Four different polls. That's what I'm saying. Young right. people, independents, black people, mm. Latinos. So it's like, don't just put that on, on black people. Like, you know, they got to figure out a way to energize America, period. Mm. Even after the State of the Union, mm. his approval ratings didn't move right. at all. And then at I think all. I read a study that said uh, one, in three, one in three people under 30 didn't even see or even hear yeah. about the state they of the union? Watch, they kept it on their TVs and they were they were doing something else while the TV was on, <laughs> but they weren't listening saying. to them. Like, but once again, Democrats do a poor job in messaging. You mean to tell me that every single network on TV, damn near, was carrying the state of the union and one in three people under the age of 30 didn't even see or hear about and it? And you know what nobody else brought up? Because, uh, you know, listen, I didn't watch it on Fox. I was watching another channel, but I think Fox carried it. Mm -hmm. And what I said to folks is, Fox carry the State of the Union. That shows you how not worried they are about Biden. That's right. That they actually carry right. his State of the Union. They That's are not right. phased by him That's at right. all. And so now let's transition to this particular subject because it's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you. What about black folks who have a problem with black folks who point out all of these things? You've experienced it. I've experienced it. A whole bunch of other folks have experienced it emanating from our community. What do you make of that? It makes me wonder what are they serving at these White House Christmas parties? Is the food so good at these White House Christmas parties that these people do not want to lose their access to these White House Christmas parties? So if Charlemagne says something about their good master Biden or Stephen A. Smith says something about their good master Biden, we got to go out there and attack them on the behalf right. of good master Biden. Why? What am I saying wrong? Because you know what? They don't do it to David Axelrod. They, I'm saying the same things that David Axelrod is saying. They don't say it to Ezra Klein when he writes his articles for the New York Times. I'm saying the same thing that Ezra Klein is saying. But as soon as I say it, all of these black people run out to try to chop my head off or chop Killer Mike's head off. And we're not... By the way, poor Killer Mike. Killer that's Mike right. hasn't said nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no, like, nothing. Killer Mike hasn't I mean, that's how we saw him. He was unfairly being detained and escorted out of the, day, yes. out of the damn yes. Grammys. Yes, they got he mad. He did at, nothing wrong. See, see, here's the thing. People don't listen, right? Killer Mike was on Bill Maher and Killer Mike was on The View. And Bill Maher, you know, asked him who he wants to endorse. He's like, look, I'm not endorsing nobody. I'm focused on local politics, whatever, whatever. But he said, I endorsed Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. right? Right. He said, I endorse Bernie Sanders, so I would tell you to support the candidate who's more likely to be in line with those progressive policies that Bernie Sanders was in line with. That's clearly President Biden. Right. But, but then Bill Maher, instead of just saying, oh, that's clearly President Biden, Bill Maher goes, why can't you just say you want, you're, you're voting for Biden? What the... What if so? What if he don't want to? Exactly. Why can't you say that, Bill Maher? Then when he was it's on your the show, yes. And then when he was, <laughs> then when he was on the View, they they tried to put him in the same trick bag. And Killer Mike goes, "Look, man, I supported Keisha Lance Bottoms. Keisha Lance Bottoms was is, was a part of the Biden administration. I supported uh, our, our our mayor Andre Dickens. I I got two Democratic. I helped to get two Democratic senators elected in uh in in, in Georgia. So I would support the people who who I would support." the person who the people I've supported are supporting. Mm -hmm. That's what he said on yeah. The View. Yeah. Instead of them going, oh, that's Biden, they start going, well, let me read you this list of things that Biden did for the black community. Mm -hmm. no, nobody's, nobody's debating that. Mm -hmm. Nobody's debating that. This is what I mean when I say the right does a better job of pushing the narrative mm -hmm. than the left does. Right. Because Mike was right there. And instead of just amplifying, okay, well, he's telling y'all to vote mm -hmm. for Biden, y'all. Y'all right. want to... But paint him as, a, as something he's not. But that's just one element. What about the advent of social media, all these social media platforms, everybody's got a voice. And if you don't parrot the speech of what the black community believes you're supposed to parrot, you're a sellout. You're what beyond all of that. Think about what they did to Ice Cube. I'm talking about us yeah, yeah, as yeah. a community. Think about what we did. Ice Cube sat up there and said, I have a plan for black America that I wanted to present. Trump entertained listening. Biden seemed reluctant to do so at the time before the 2020 election. And this dude, a former member of NWA, for crying out loud, who is as raw 
and as real as it gets, mm -hmm. was crucified by our own. What do you make of that? Um, I think I think that. Listen, I think there might be some fair criticism with everything that everybody's saying, okay. right? I think with the Ice Cube situation, there might have been some fair criticism because I'm the type of person, I'm not going alone because I know I'm not no expert. Right. I may have the platform, right, right? and I, I may have the have right. the ears to the people, but I'm not the expert, so I'm going to bring the experts. experts with me. That's right. You know? So I, I, if I was Ice Cube, I wouldn't have wanted to have that meeting by myself right? Like, because I know he didn't help put together that plan for black America by itself. Right. So bring those experts with you that helped put together that plan. I wasn't plan. aware that, that he was going by himself. I didn't know that. I didn't know. He I mean, was going that's by that's himself. what it seemed okay. like. I don't okay. know if that's the case, right? Okay. Like, like for me, I would have just amplified the plan and said, "Hey, these people helped me put together this plan." Which I think, I, which mm -hmm. I, if I'm not mistaken, I heard him mention a couple right. of names, but I don't want to say the names because I'm not right. sure if that's the case or not. But I think in situations like that, we have to use our, I guess, whatever you want to call it, access, celebrity, mm -hmm. whatever to amplify the, the actual experts. That's the whole objective. Yeah. To us to have a platform, you want to amplify an issue, you want to amplify the people that are around you who are the experts. You want to put folks in a position where real stuff can actually get done. Real dialogue can take place, real stuff can get done. I remember I was getting crucified, man, and, and, and Joe Madison, God rest his soul, passed away, uh, the Black Eagle, uh, hosted Sirius X, Sirius yeah, 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 man, absolutely. I remember years ago he called me because I was giving a speech at Vanderbilt. One of the things that I would, I would normally say when I was giving these speeches is I said, for one election, I wish everyone would vote Republican. And they were like, what? You know, because I started off by saying racism doesn't exist. And then I would pause and I would say, obviously, I'm lying. Of course it does. You just don't have that as an excuse for stymieing your growth and moving mm -hmm. forward and, and progressing. They would cut out the part where I said, obviously, I'm lying. Of course it exists. And just said, Stephen A said, oh, racism doesn't exist. You know, and luckily, I have my own platform, so I don't worry about making sure the voice gets heard. But in the end, I'm bringing it up because I think it's important to point this out. The only point that I was trying to make when I say stuff like that is flatter us. We go in situations, we let you give us lip service during election year, tell us what we've let this happen for decades, and then nothing gets done. When you look at the Hispanic population and the one benefit one could argue about immigration being such a fervent issue is that it's in the mind's eye of politicians, so you have to at least come across like you're doing something. Mm -hmm. Whereas with us, Nobody had to do that. I said, you go to get a car, you don't just buy it, you test drive it. That's right. You got a house, you walk through it, you see it. What's up? You don't just sit up there and transparently give, your, give somebody your vote because you serve to disenfranchise yourself. On one hand, you got one side that knows you ain't going to never support them, so they don't have to do a damn thing for you. And on the other side, they get to take you for granted. So there's but so much they're going to do for you. And I think that's how we've hurt ourselves. That's the position that I've always taken. What about you? What you said is interesting just now because, uh, you know, I've heard plenty of people, especially for the last couple of elections, they're like, we're just going to hold our vote, period. Let the Democrats fall flat on their face. I've never heard them say, let's go out and vote Republican. That's right. <laughs> you know, but that's, right. that's At inter the time. I didn't but, say that recently. But, but, I'll tell you that much. But the reason I think <laughs> that's interesting is because, you know, people will be like, you can't, you cannot encourage people not to vote. Right. Which I agree. I feel like everybody should go out there and vote. But I'm not, I, I can't tell you who to vote for. Right. You know, I, I can tell you what, I feel like this candidate is doing, and I can tell you what I feel like this candidate is doing. I can tell you what I feel like is going to happen in this country if this person gets elected. I can tell you what I feel like is going to happen in this country if this person gets elected. Once I lay all that on the table, you got to make your own decision. I think right now, you know, we're in, um, we're, we're in a place where there are a lot of people even saying that this year. Like, I'm not voting. I'm, let, 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 let this country fall on its face. Like, I, this ain't, this not the year to do that. Now, we say that every presidential right. election cycle. This is really not the year right. <laughs> to do that. But I can totally understand why people feel that way. And I think folks get upset when we're just listening to what the people are saying and, what, and feeling what the people are feeling and expressing that to folks. I'm telling the Democratic Party, this is how people are feeling. This is what people are saying. The exhausted majority. Folks is just tired. What about the Democratic Party focusing on the extreme stuff? I mean, I don't, you know, when... They were, you had folks on the right arguing about the economy. You had folks on the left arguing about who should be allowed in bathrooms. Stuff like that. Oh, I, 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 I mean, yeah, it, no, some, no, of these, yeah, yeah. some of these other arguments, I mean, it was driving me crazy. I'm like, <laughs> that's not, at the end of the day, that's not going to swing no. votes one way or the other. No, I, I, I always say that, you know, we, we made a lot of micros, macros. People are human at the end of the day. What did I say earlier? People care about upward mobility and security. 
people want to feel safe. That's mm -hmm. it. That's right. it. I don't care what type of human you are on this right. planet, no matter what your I, sexual, uh, your gender identity That's is, it. your sexuality, nothing. People just want to feel safe. Whoever is in that White House, whoever your your your, your governor is, or you know your 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 your, your, your senators, all that, we want people in those positions who can make sure that we got some money in our pocket and can make us feel safe. So you know what they're gonna say? They're gonna say with Trump, it was the economy and national security was not something that he was shy about promoting as well. So if you got those two elements, that's about money in your pocket. That's right. That's about safety, and they'll lean on that, and they say that makes him a better candidate than Joe Biden. Man, do you know? Do you know back in January, right? I was doing an interview with Fox News, uh, Joseph, who does the digital uh, digital stuff at Fox News. And he asked me a simple question. He said, Charlamagne, do you think um, the border is going to be an issue come November? And I said, hell yes. hell yes. And the reason I said hell yes is because for the first time in my community, people are talking to me about what's happening at the border. Not because they're anti-immigrant. Right. You know, uh, they're not xenophobic. No. Right. What they were talking about is the fact that they felt like those individuals were getting resources we want that to get the it. black community has never gotten. Eric Adams, and not his fault, Governor Oakland, but $53 million prepaid credit cards Come on. for un undocumented or illegal Come immigrants. On, but when was that, when was that happening Come for on. black people? And, 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 and those are just basic necessities, yes. right? Yes. Food and a roof over your head. There is some people in this, there's a lot of people in this country who don't have that. So if you think that they're going to look at, you know, these people coming in from other countries and they're getting they're getting re rewarded with those things and they don't have it, you think they're not going to raise hell? Mm -hmm. You think they're not going to ha have a fit? Then I had people coming to me in New York City talking to me about how, you know, gangs from different countries were coming in and running through their neighborhoods, like causing problems. So what are we talking about again? Money and safety. So these are real conversations that I was having with real people. This ain't nothing I was reading, wasn't no statistics. These are people calling the phone lines and people that I'm actually talking to. So I said that. And do you know, they ran an article, they ran an article on MSNBC that said, Charlemagne the God is pushing MAGA messaging. Yeah. Now- They've done it to me about three times. Now, now, They've done it to me about three times. Now in March, it's the number one issue, the border. That's right. Now you got President Biden, you know, down at the border, Asking Donald Trump, let's fix this together. Right. It's like, yo, just listen to the people. And Donald Trump is 300 miles away at the border blaming Biden you know what for saying? what's going on. You know what I'm saying? But that, that just comes from me listening to people. Mm -hmm. I really think sometimes, man, we sit in our positions of privilege and we forget about, you know, the, the least of us in this country. But when you talk to the least of us in this country and see what the least of us in this country want, you get a really good picture of what America needs. Have you ever been more worried about the black community than you are right now? Man, that's a fantastic question. Have I ever been more worried? More worried. That's a good question, man. And and, and the reason the reason that's such a good question because it's on my nerves every day, Stephen A, if I'm being totally honest with you. Yeah, 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 it, 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 just, it, it just is what every it is. Every, 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 every. Hey, damn excuse my language. Day. Absolutely Every true. Every damn day. It's absolutely true. But, I love us. I love us too. But, but damn. 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 Yeah, I, and I'm sorry. I know it's mixed company. No, 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 talking no, 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 but it other. is what it is. Yeah, I just, yeah, it just, um, I don't know if I'm more worried because I do feel like, I do feel like there's enough of us in certain positions and enough of us with a certain consciousness that we really want what's best for yeah. our people. And it's mm -hmm. a lot of us, a lot of folks that I see, they're not waiting on nobody. They're right. not waiting on government. Like, there's a lot of people using their own resources yeah. to do things, you know, for us. Like, for me, I, I, my mother's alma mater is South Carolina State University. Mm -hmm. I opened up, you know, a, a scholarship in my mother's name at South Carolina State yeah. University. I gave right them a quarter million dollars out of my own pocket, you right. know? Like, I have a partnership with the food bank in Harlem because I'm sitting there talking about we got to keep people's food. Right. We got to keep uh, food on these people. And I'm happy table. to help with that, by the way. I, I, oh, I'll, oh, they, oh they, they'd love to have you yeah, out absolutely. there. You know, so it's certain things that I see a lot of us doing, like, you know, my, my, my nonprofit, the Mental Wealth Alliance, you know, where we're trying to get 10 million black and brown people, you know, free therapy over the next five years. Like, you know, every day we're making, you know, strides towards those type of things. So I think that there's a lot of people who aren't waiting on anybody, a lot of black people who aren't waiting on anybody who are taking our destiny and into our, our own hands. So that, that gives me a lot of hope. But man, when I go on this, yeah. boy, it makes me hate, it makes me hate us sometimes. And why does it make you hate? 
because we we, we 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 tear each other down in ways like for example we talk about president biden right yeah. we give white men like president biden so much grace yeah. but don't give each other none zero zero right. You can talk, you bring up President Biden's 94 crime bill or the 86 mandatory minimum sentencing or the 88 crack law, they'll make up all types of excuses as to why that happened. Yep. People should be allowed to change and this and that. But you don't do that with your own people. That's right. You don't do that with your own people. And you know what they'll say? People. They'll say, who, uh, Stephen A., who the hell are you to talk? Charlamagne God, who the hell are you to talk? Because people come on y'all shows and y'all grill them every day or y'all will call it like y'all see it, but y'all knock it down to black man every day. That's what they'll say. Mm -hmm. That's what they'll say about you. That's what they'll say about me. How do you respond to that? Um, I don't think we're I don't think we're knocking down black men. Neither I think I. Having, I think having conversations with people is not knocking them down. You know, I think you know if you feel if you or see, calling it like you see it for stuff that they do in front of millions of people. Yeah, and and I'm not I'm I'm not calling for somebody to be erased off the face of the earth. Like right. you know what I mean? I'm not trying to go prune their timeline and get rid of them all together. Mm -hmm. We're just having conversations. The same way when people disagree with things that I say, I'll listen. I don't have no problem apologizing if I'm wrong. Right. You know, I don't have Neither no do problem I. saying, hey, you know what? I got that wrong. My fault. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem doing that. And I don't have a problem bringing the person I was talking about onto the platform so right. we can have, you know, a conversation right. amongst each other. I think I think that's really good for our community to see. I've cut back on that. Let really? me holler at you about that. Okay. Let me tell you why. YouTube. I got a YouTube show here. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, on, I'm, part, I'm your teammate on iHeartRadio now and stuff like that. Love it. Here's the deal. Because you can make money now doing that shit, that's what you got cats doing. They ain't whispering and saying stuff privately or, or just saying something on a social media platform <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for you to see. Now they want everybody to yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want it monetized. Yeah. They don't have to have proof. They don't have to have validity evidence. They don't have to back it up with something to facts. They don't have to do any of that. Now you are trying to act like you all up in your feelings, like you're really, really conscientious, when in fact, you're just trying to get paid. Yeah, you just want you 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 want me to respond. That's right. So then now you got more content. Right. Or you want access to the platform because right. I might invite you on to have the conversation, or I might go to your platform to have the conversation. Right. No, you're, you're 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 right about that. You're right about that. Like you know, we are in a a word economy mm. nowadays, and like nobody cares Not about world word word, and, word. And, and and nobody cares about the truth of those words if the lie is more entertaining. And they'll say, who the hell are y'all to say that? But my response to that would be, well, we were doing this before the advent of social media. So clearly our intent as professionals, this is what we're conducting on a day in, day out basis. Me for over 30 years, you for at least over 20 some odd years. Yeah, yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So that's the way I look at it now. But again, I'll come back to you and ask, any hope whatsoever, silver lining, you yeah, know, a light not, at the end of the rainbow down, you know, down the line. Yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot of hope because mm -hmm. I, like, you know, be, it's, it's a double-edged sword when it comes to social media, right? Because the problem with social media is it gave everybody a voice. But the, the gift of social media is it gave everybody a voice. So when I look at brothers like Ernie Leisure, you know, Rashad and Troy, when I look yeah. at bro brothers like 19 Keys, when I look at brothers like, you know, Wall Street Trapper, when I even look at, like, a lot of the athletes who are, you know, I love what the pivot is doing. Like, yes, the, the conversations that they having over there, them brothers is helping, proud of them. helping folks heal, right. like, in, in, a, in, a, in a real way. Ryan when Clark. I, Ryan Jimmy Clark. Tatum, and I, oh, my Taylor. God. Oh, man. I, I, I love it. When I see stuff like that, when I see people, you know, able to control their own narratives and put those kind of things out there, it gives me a lot of hope. Because right. Malcolm X said, you know, a person who controls the media controls the minds of the masses. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, you know, we do have a lot of good people that are in positions of power, you know, in, uh, with, with different platforms. And I think they're putting a lot of, a lot of good stuff out there. So there's, uh, there's always hope. But we have to understand everybody can go. Everybody you can. know what I'm saying? You got to leave, leave some people behind. You got to leave some people behind. Listen, read, when you read the Bible... There's a, there's a couple of stories in the Bible. Mm -hmm. God told Noah, look, build the ark. That's right. Everybody and, can't and, come. And you, and you can tell them what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of doubters. There's going to be a lot of naysayers. People are going to critique you and all of this and that. Don't worry about it. Whoever f believes you, that's who's going to come with you. Right. They, I bet you they believed when it started raining. No and doubt. those doors started closing. And the floods started building. You, you look at Lot, right? Lot took his family, and Lot was arguing with God. Like, God, there's some good people back there. Oh, damn it! Go go find go find one lot. Right. If you can find one, I'll spare the whole city. <laughs> lot couldn't find one. Right. Lot's wife had to look back, turn the salt. I bet you Lot ain't look back with her after that. That's right. You know, so it's just like 
Everybody can't go, and we have to understand that. So who are the people that can't go? I don't, I'm not asking names. <laughs> I'm not asking names. I'm talking about classification, the kind of folks that you're talking about. Let's crystallize it. Let's crystallize it for the Good audience. Question. Who are the kind of folks that got to be left behind? We got to say, they let, their asses got to stay. We can't go, We can't bring them with us. Who I, are those people? I, I think anybody who's not willing to have genuine conversation. I think what you said a little while ago is, is very important. Like, some people are just doing this for entertainment purposes. And, you know, I don't feel like, you know, what we're going through in this country, who we are in this country, I don't think that's a joke. I don't think that should it be ain't. for somebody's, you know, uh, entertainment value. So... The, the, the individuals who really just want confrontation over conversation, the individuals that we know, wherever we go, they're going to cause conflict. You got to do them like, like Harriet Tubman would have did them. Internal conflict. Internal conflict. conflict. You got to do them like Harriet Tubman would have did them. Shoot them right there on the spot. They Ooh, can't come. With every, right. Everybody cannot, 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 cannot go with us. And I think, I think we know who a lot of those individuals yeah, are. They, they, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of us who have a, a, a long history and a long resume of just wanting to cause conflict right. amongst us, cause right. conflict amongst each other. And, you know, I think those individuals, like, let them, let them go figure out something else. Some, Last question on this else. subject. As you consider the role that you play when you take the position that you just articulated, is that your approach and you just keep it to yourself and you do it? Or is that a message that you try to disseminate to as many people who are willing to listen that are in our position mm -hmm. that have the ability to sort of provoke change in some way? Oh, no, yeah, I have these conversations all the time, publicly uh, and, and, and privately, you know, because like, I, I feel like we all can create our own ecosystems with mm -hmm. our own, you know, like-minded individuals. And mm -hmm. I, try to be, I try to be around like-minded individuals who I see, you know, doing things for our people on their own. I, and, I, and I'm also willing to build with the elected officials who are in these positions of power, because I can't sit here and act like, especially in my hometown, Mount Corner, South Carolina, the low country area, Charleston and all that. Man, there's so many great, you know, uh, congressmen, like my man, um, my man, my man, J.A. Moore, mm -hmm. like people like that who helped me get things done for our community. So I'm not going to ever sit here and act like, you know, government doesn't play a role because it absolutely positively, positively right. does. You know, but um, we yeah. just don't need government dependency. We don't need we don't we need, need government we need help, dependency. But dependency is different. Yeah, we don't need government dependency until we can put those people in positions that we can actually depend on. That's right. Like there's people that we know we can depend on if they get in that position. Like if a Nina Turner was an elected official, we know we could depend on you know somebody like her. But we don't have too many of those. So the ones that we do have you know, in those positions, mm -hmm. we got to support them. We got to support the Ayanna Presleys of the world, you know. We got to support those people who are in Congress, who we know are fighting for us every day. But like I said, for me, I'm willing to work with anybody who's willing to work with me and work on the things that mm -hmm. I want to get done, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for us as a people. And, and once again, man, we had these conversations about black people. Black people are human beings. That's right. We want upward mobility and safety. How can we get some money in our pocket and, and be safe and be safe and free to spend it? By the way, that's it. Free like, to spend like, it without that, having to worry that's about right. stuff. That's right. That's right. It's not. It's not. It's not rocket science here, mm. people. So when you have these, when that, when you're an elected official or anybody, and you're mm. sitting around having these conversations about what black mm. people want, ask yourself, what do you want? Somebody would look at us right now and accuse us of having a quote unquote black liberal conversation. Either though, neither you, neither you nor I feel that way. We're just having a real conversation. What are your thoughts about black conservatives? Um, and I say that black conservatives as in black conservatism as opposed to the MAGA Republicans. I'm not trying yes. to. I'm just talking black conservatives. What are your thoughts about that? I don't, I don't have a problem with uh, black conservatives. I do have a problem with black MAGA because it feels like MAGA is so against the basic interest of black people. That's why even when, you know, President Biden was on Breakfast Club and he said, if you don't know whether to vote for me or Trump, then you, then you, you ain't, ain't black. black. That didn't insult me because I understood what he was saying. It like, bothered me, though. Really? You know why it bothered me? Because he was talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're a brother that has tackled so many issues, and nobody's perfect and nobody's flawless, but you've done a hell of a lot more good than, than anyone could ever, than anyone has ever given you credit for as far as I'm concerned. And I respect the hell out of you because of it. It bothered me that he said that to you mm -hmm. because I'm like, who the hell are you? 
to say something <laughs> like that. Now, I, I, I wouldn't think about what he said as much as him of all people mm -hmm. saying it because we just removed it. If we can hold Trump and, you know, as a landlord and as, a, you know, as an owner, as a homeowner, I was as a landlord more so than anything else in the 70s, if we could hold those things against him, if we can hold the Central Park Five against him, all right, we can certainly hold stuff against Biden from the 90s in the crime oh, bill. Oh, absolutely. And so for 100%. him to be in 2020 saying that to you, trying to absolve himself from all that he did, and like, yo, this ain't the dude you want. You want me, and if you don't know better, you ain't black. That bothered me. And I, and I think that he, we got to that statement because of 17 minutes of intense questioning about that, yeah, fair. Ab 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 about his record. And I think he was just you know, flustered. Listen, I don't like making excuses for white people, you know what I mean? But just in that moment, right. I, I felt like he was simply saying, if you don't know whether, if you vote for Trump, you're voting against your, your own interests. So right. I just think when it comes to MAGA, right. in general, you're voting against your own interests. But I don't have a problem with tried and true black conservatives, especially when you have conversations with them and you see why they decided they wanted to, you know, vote Republican. It's literally just all about the money. Most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time, it's literally just about the money. That's why I go back to what I said about Nikki Haley. I feel like Republicans missed a good opportunity to have somebody in a general election who could probably get votes from both sides just because people want something different. I don't think, I think there's a, there's a lot of black people, especially probably down south, who might have more conservative values than they, than they, than they lead on, you know? And I, and I think that she might have been able to galvanize some of those people. Election is eight months away. Mm -hmm. What is Charlemagne the God going to be saying over the next eight months to the American people, specifically to black America? And what do you expect the fallout of your words to be? I'm going to say the same thing I've been saying. I feel like, you know, Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. I feel like, you know, this is a man who led an attempted coup of this country. I can't even believe that we're talking about him like he's a normal candidate. That's the other thing that bothers me about the media. We're acting like all of this stuff that's happening right now in front of us is normal. Like this guy got 91 criminal charges, four indictments. He's been impeached twice. He, he shouldn't be allowed to work at Walmart. Nonetheless, run for president, and nothing wrong with Walmart. I love Walmart, right. by the way. But and I'm you saying, have people, if he were convicted, because it's still possible he can be right. convicted right. of a felony, right. they would still vote for him, that's and right. we have nothing in our Constitution that that's prevents right. him from running that's right. and continuing to run. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep saying that about Trump, but I'm going to also keep saying about, you know, President Biden and his administration, especially if they're not pivoting, where, like right now, I still don't see the sense of urgency. And I hate when politicians put more on us, the people, they put more weight on us to show up and vote as opposed to putting weight on themselves to give us something to show up and vote for. Like yet, we're, we're here with another presidential election where the only thing they're selling people is fear. Now, should we be afraid this time? <laughs> Absolutely. But once again, if this is what you've done every single presidential election since I've been alive, you become the party who cried wolf. And that's what I feel like the Democrats are right now. They're the party who cried wolf. Because now that the wolf is actually there, nobody believes it. But when it. you tell black folks this, they're going to have a problem with you, Charlamagne. You shouldn't have a problem with me. I have a problem with... You should have a problem I know with, they shouldn't. You should have a problem with that campaign. I know they shouldn't. And you should, but, but, but you know how we can be. Yes. So, what you going to do? I'm going I'm to keep speaking truth to power because I feel like that's, that's, what, that's what God has me here to do. And that's what I see. So, until I see something different... Mm -hmm then I'll start speaking something different. As of right now, I don't see anything different to speak on. And I hope, you know, President Biden does some really incredible things over the next couple of months to really start energizing people. And I hope that he starts to lean on his, his surrogates a lot more. I still want to see more VP Harris out there. I still want to see, you know, She got to resonate, though, Charlamagne, man. She got to resonate, man. It can't just be, excuse me, she's the VP. So if this dude ends up stepping away and at the Democratic National Convention, they want somebody else instead of, and they convince him to step back because he just doesn't have it. Oh, excuse me, she's automatically next in line. She's got to go get it. If she would just, if, I promise she's you. She's got to go get it. If she would just be herself a little bit. I'm talking about she had attitude. a little You're bit. You're very supportive of her, it seems. She had attitude with you when you spoke to her. I want her to have that with 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 the people. Well, you got you, you grilled about much. Yes, and I want a uh, mansion. Mansion, mansion, And, and, and mansion, I want mansion, I want I want her to have that same energy with the people who are actually threatening 
democracy. Mm. That's what I want. I want her to go out there and prosecute the case uh, against Donald Trump in this country. My man, appreciate Stephen you, man. A. Thanks appreciate a lot. you, brother. Thanks a lot. Yes, the one and only Charlemagne the God right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with more of my thoughts in a minute. I need to make sure you all know that the NBA playoffs are just around the corner. And I don't know about you all, but I need to be a part of that action. So how do I do that? I use prize picks. That's how. The largest fantasy sports platform in all the land with more than 3 million members. It's not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from the NBA, the WNBA, MLB, and then choose more or less on their in-game stats, which means every assist, basket, or hit will turn the big game's energy into cash, all right? So if I know that Jokic is grabbing 10 rebounds tonight and Jamal Murray is hitting four threes, I need to pick that and play for a chance to be rolling in some big-time money. So go to prizepicks.com and use promo code SAS for a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. That's right. Go to prizepicks.com, tap in my initials SAS for a first-time deposit match of up to $100. That's code SAS when you go to prizepicks.com. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Um, <clears throat> I really loved that interview. There's a lot that this podcast, this show is about, but none more so than what you just witnessed. One-on-one -on -one conversations is not going to be an aberration. It's going to be pretty close to the norm as we move forward during this show. And a lot of the issues that were tackled are going to continue to be tackled. Because what I want everybody to understand is that, to me, I didn't just have a conversation about politics. I had a conversation about life, particularly life emanating from the black community, because I'm a black man. And I'm going to discuss issues that are pertinent to my community as well as is pertinent to our society as a whole. I'm just not going to run from it. I'm just not going to avoid it. And I'm not going to be scared to address things that need to be addressed. And I love having people on this show that are just as fearless while being as substantive as Charlemagne the God was on issues that really, really resonate with us as a community and as a, as a society. That's just the way that it is. It's just the way that it's going to be. I'm not changing. I watched people talk last week and I brought this up on Monday show where you had people going off about how I didn't know much about politics because of my comments about the state of the union address. Well, damn it. I didn't care about most of the issues that he was discussing because I already knew what his positions were. What I cared about was how y'all tried to sell us on him being energetic for an hour and 10 minutes and acting like that's validation that guess what? We ain't got nothing to worry about over the next four years. After he turns 82 this coming November. It makes no sense. There's complaints on the right and the left. I'm not trying to be a political aficionado. What I am is an American citizen who's a black man who cares about issues that are pertinent to our community and our society. I've never run from discussing these issues before, and I'll be damned if I'm going to run from them now. So what you saw today, Ms. Chalamet, expect to see more. I'm not going away. Neither is he, neither are a bunch of other people who care enough to tackle the issues that need to be tackled. Get used to the Stephen A. Smith show. I'm here for a while. Until next time, everybody. Peace and love. Be safe. God bless. See you in a couple of days.